May Christ's word only be heard, and Christ's word only be spoken. Amen. Don't we all need a word of healing this morning? Don't we all have a sense of brokenness? I think for healing, after learning of the acts of terror perpetrated in Paris this weekend, leaving over 129 dead,
break from the family, a worldwide oneness. We are one, so much more alike than we are different from one another. So I hope we can keep a vision that Parisians are our brothers and sisters, just as New Yorkers in our way are our brothers and sisters, just as the children of Syria are our children, as are the teenagers of refugees and displaced persons by war and violence. Think of the children of Newtown and Columbine. They're all our children. One human family. Yet how is it that in our brokenness, we polarize ourselves, we default to some fearful place where we clutch and grab and protect and operate out of that more primitive part of our brain that neurologists call the amygdala. It's the same part of the brain that we share with reptiles, I understand. Still, Jesus says, even amid the destruction and the tumult in our time, our call is to remain faithful and loving people as Jesus showed us how to be. If we can stay faithful and true to that, something new will be born. So I pray that we don't let cynicism and scorn or fear affect our hearts, because we know from Scripture and from the witness of Jesus that all things are possible in Christ. With God, we are promised that something new will emerge from the ashes. Now you have two Trinity delegates in Peg Barn and Gail Pickett who joined Matt and me this weekend at our annual diocesan convention. We went up to Hartford with 600 other members of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. And we've been reminded there in the last two days that our beloved church is heaving change. We're shrinking and our losses are devastating to the greater church. That old institution with its great stones is no longer sustained by the member pledges and the commitment that used to make this church, this Episcopal church that we love so much, it's no longer the vibrant It needs to reimagine itself. It needs to morph from maintenance to mission, from maintaining the great stones, our historic buildings, and going out and developing a network of shared systems and resources. We love our church. We want it to live. We want it to thrive. And so we're being advised to be more mission-minded, to get out of our buildings and find out What's God doing out there in the neighborhood? And then, once we try to, once we begin to figure that out, once we discern carefully what God is doing out there, then we're invited to go and participate in God's mission. Of course, we love this building too. This is our spiritual home. This is a place with so much legacy where we offer our prayers and our worship week by week, day by day. But how do we participate more fully in God's mission? We're going through birth pangs. Out of this time of change, something new is being born. And we are called to keep the faith and the trust that God is with us, guiding our path to a new day of peace and fruitfulness. Like Hannah in our Hebrew scripture this morning, who was grieving because she longed so desperately for a child to be that she was taunted for being barren. We could be more like her and put all of our efforts into prayer. She prayed with every ounce of passion, God, if you will only give me a son, I will give him over to your care and have him raised in your temple as a Nazarite, as a holy man. And then God granted her prayer and a child was born. It was a miracle. And I kept her vow and gave over her son to the temple to be raised in God's care. And then after other priests had corrupted the temple, her son Samuel grew up to be one of the most faithful leaders portrayed in the Bible. It's Samuel who is the one who anoints David to be the king of Israel. Yes, change is all around us, and Jesus assures us that God is acting in the tumult. 
even though it may be hard for us to see. The losses are staggering, and the contractions are sharply painful. But my call to action to you this morning is, how can we be more like Hannah and pray our way through the losses we see around us? For people who need to pray for peace. And they say that prayer is dispositive. Not meaning negative, but dispositive in that it disposes us to act. It disposes us to be people of peace if we're praying for peace. To be people of peace in every unique way that you and I are able. Being bridge builders in our workplace, in our schools, at home, being restorers of the breach between cultures and between different faiths. Being God's people who know what forgiveness is, what it means, and acting on it. And indeed, our prayers go out to God perfectly this morning 